So I'm going to offer a three-part presentation. The first part will be uh, an analytical framework of how to understand Russia through time. The second part will be some brief comments of how to understand the Cold War, in my view. And then the final part will be a little bit uh, on the readings that I asked people to uh, consult, the telegrams from Novikov, uh, Kennan, and Roberts. And then, of course, we'll go to discussion, seminar style, and anything is fair game. If I mentioned it, if I didn't mention it, whatever's on your mind, whatever you'd like to comment on or ask a question about. Okay, so now the first part, uh, an analytical framework for understanding uh, Russia. I apologize for people who've heard me speak before because you might have heard some of this previously, but that doesn't mean because it's been said before that it's old news. Okay, so there are four pieces to my understanding of the Russian long-term uh, proposition. The first is that Russia is European, but not Western. This means that Russia is an integral part of European culture and civilization. It would be impossible to imagine European culture and civilization, for example, without Tolstoy or without uh, fill in the blank Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, etc. Uh, Russia is a spectacular uh, cultural phenomenon, but it is part of Europe in cultural terms. However, Russia is not and never has been part of Europe in the sense of it's not Western. For example, Japan is not European at all, but it is Western. It has Western style institutions and values. Western is not a geographic concept. It is instead an institutional and ultimately a values proposition. It means a, a rule of law. It means constraint on executive power and separation of powers. It means a free and open society. It means an uh, independent judiciary, and we could go on. Uh, I hesitate to go into too much detail on the concept of the West, since another person on this Zoom has uh, recently finished an important book about the West, uh, which I would be happy to discuss if it came up in the, the follow-on Q&A. So this means that there are very significant limits on cooperation with Russia and the West, since it is not a Western power and is not on the path to become Western in institutional and value terms. It also means, however, that there are significant limits on Russia's relations in the Far East, because although China, for example, is also non-Western, Russia is European. And so Russia has a pull, a kind of undertow or pull, as we would say in speaking about, for example, the oceans towards Europe, which puts a ceiling on the extent to which Russia and China can get, further, can get closer and closer. It doesn't prohibit that, it just puts a ceiling on how far that can Russia is alienated from the West, mostly by choice. At the same time, Russia can never alienate completely because it's European. Russia is close to China today, closer than it's been otherwise in my lifetime, including in the early Soviet period, when the closeness was barbed. The early Chinese communist period, I'm sorry, when the closeness was barbed. But once again, there are limits there. Okay. The second of my four point proposition on Russian through the ages and analytical framework is that Russia is relatively backward. It's not backward, it's relatively backward. It is not the first or even the second great power. In fact, Russia is predominantly a commodity exporter. It used to export grain, grain uh, being the primary export for the longest period 
much longer than the hydrocarbon era that we're in. Russia at one time fed both Germany and Britain. The two powers that went to war in the First World War were both fed, both gigantic importers of Russian grain. Even after 1917, grain uh, was the key to the Soviet economy, and for a, a while thereafter, grain exports were seen as the, a critical lever uh, for the country's development. Eventually, as I said, hydrocarbons displaced grain, but the commodity exporting nature of Russian power and the Russian economy has persisted. This means that Russia is utterly dependent on technology transfer and FDI from the most advanced countries. All commodity exporters have a dependency on technology transfer and FDI. Of course, nowadays, Russia has very poor relations with the most advanced countries and is not benefiting from significant technology transfer or FDI. And as a result, the Russian economy is in a period of stagnation or if you want devolution even. You'll notice that there has been very little significant technology transfer from China to Russia. The Chinese are only sending technology to Russia that enhances Chinese power. So for example, 5G, which gives China control over the Russian communication network, they're happy to transfer that technology. But otherwise, they're very cautious. So there's a technology desert in Russia today, which cannot persist indefinitely. Uh, commodity exporters cannot persist for long periods of time without technology transfer and FDI, foreign direct investment. Okay, number three. What we see after a long period of desert in the technology transfer is a sudden rapprochement with the West. The rapprochement with the West is usually led by someone who's called a reformer someone who seems very pro-Western, but these only happen as the gap with the West has increased and has frightened the anti-Western security services and the hard men who generally call the shots inside a Russian regime. And so the reformers face is out front and the reformer seems to be pushing and doing uh, uh, the main agent of the reform, but the reformers path to power was only possible because the hard men were frightened by the widening gap between Russia's power and Western power or other advanced countries. In fact, Gorbachev was brought to power by the KGB. Okay. So reform doesn't just happen because there are some nice people and they're pro-Western. Reform happens because of a panic from the unnice people. Because of this problem of technology desert, FDI desert, widening gap with the West. This doesn't mean that they're ready to import Western ideas and Western institutions and values. They're looking for Western technology and an enhancement of Russian power. There are some in the reformist camp who also want the constitutionalism, the constraints on executive power, the rule of law. Invariably, they turn out to be a minority and they turn out to have a lot less power than we impute to them. Moreover, if you look at the historic ratings of all pro-Western, as opposed to anti-Western figures in Russian history, you will notice that the pro-Western figures average under 1% in the polls, as opposed to the anti-Western figures, including the figure who's in power today in Russia, they tend to have much higher approval ratings, uh, beginning with Stalin. We think of Peter the Great as pro-Western, but once again, he encapsulates this model of importation of Western technique and Western money, but not necessarily of Western institutions in the sense of separation of powers, constraints on executive power, right? 
Helium port institutions, not rule of law, but rule by law. Helium port institutions that increase state capacity, the state's ability to impose its will, but not institutions that will constrain the state's ability to impose its will on behalf of civil liberties or property rights. So this is a long-standing dynamic. Once again, it's different under different incarnations of the regime that's in power. It's not the same exactly, but it is a long-term pattern with the differentiation. I could go into the differentiation between the czarist Soviet and Putin regimes as necessary, but it's the pattern that's important. Okay, you'll notice that this is often laced with a sense of special mission in the world, a sense of messianism, so that the anti-Westernism is not anti alone, it is pro in the sense of a dynamic, a pro-Russian dynamic, which is uh, uh, usually formulated as Russia being a providential power, a power under God, having a special mission in the world, a unique civilization. And so the anti-Westernism is given a positive cast, which is deeply embedded and widely popular inside the country. It sometimes takes the form of other ideological spin-offs, like for example, uh, Eurasianism we've seen and various other versions of this. But the main point is, you know, third Rome, special mission, providential power. Russia is not just anti-Western, it's a civilization unto itself. It's Eastern, Eastern Orthodox, it's Russia. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll note in history, which is very interesting, when Alexander Nevsky, the medieval figure, was faced with difficulties on two fronts, German power from the West and Mongol power from the East. He decided to fight, to stand and fight German power and to accommodate to Eastern power or Mongol power. That dynamic is what we see today because Western power wants to change your soul. It wants to change your culture, your civilization. Whereas Eastern power doesn't care what your internal organization is. They just want you to pay the tribute. And so Mongol rule in Russia did not compel a fundamental transformation in internal political organization or values. However, that was what Nevsky fe feared if they were to lose the battle with German power encroaching from the West. In other words, the West was closer in civilization and potentially a displacement of Russia's own unique civilization. And so the bargain was accommodate to the East and save your soul. Lose your sovereignty, but save your soul. As opposed to accommodate to the West and lose your sovereignty and lose your soul at the same time. Okay, point number four. The quest to overcome the relative backwardness, the quest to overcome the gap with the West in terms of technology and power leads to campaigns for a strong state. Not just these periodic reforms where the hard men panic, but also an ideology and a practice of building what's called a strong state. Because the strong state is seen as the instrument to overcome the backwardness, to shrink the gap with the West or the greater powers. The strong state approach, which we are living through now, inevitably has culminated in personal rule. And so you don't get a strong state. Instead, you get personal rule. You get a regime instead of a strong state. Russia has a big fiscal military state but it also has a parasitic regime that eats away 
at the strength of that state in the name of a supposed strong state. And there's a conflation of national interest with the survivability of that personal regime. And all of a sudden we hear that the person equals the country. And the person must stay in power to save the country. And there's no difference between the country and the person. You know, without Putin, there's no Russia. That's, we see nonsense like this. A conflation of state interests with personal rule. It happens time and time again in the quest to build the strong state. So once again, the reformer interludes that come by have an ephemeral quality to them. The hard men panic, the reformer in the front, right? Again and again, each time because of the fear of the gap with the West. But the strong state personal rule dynamic to overcome the gap with the West, that's something which has been much more enduring and lasts longer in time than the reform ostensibly pro-Western episode. Anyhow, you get the point. This is my four point analytical framework for understanding Russia through time. The implications for US-Russia relations, which I'll draw out before I mention the Cold War here. The implications for US-Russia relations are that bad relations are not a freak. They're not an accident. They're not an idiosyncrasy. They're not a mistake. They're not a misunderstanding. Tense relations between the US and Russia derive from the fact that there's a fundamental clash of interests and even more deeply a fundamental clash of values. The primary value in US culture is freedom, often understood as freedom from the state. The primary in value in Russian culture is the state. Now, these are broad strokes. There need to be qualifications and nuance. There are exceptions to these patterns. These patterns are not 100% comprehensive. They are handles to be able to engage in the discussion. So the goal for US-Russia relations, in my view, has always been managing the fundamental clash of state interests and tensions. It has not been, let's be friends, let's be allies, let's pretend it's just a misunderstanding. You know, the previous administration was a bunch of idiots. We're brilliant. We'll reset the relationship and do it right. We'll listen to them, we'll talk more, will reset. And then it doesn't work, but then the next administration comes in and they discover that the previous administration were a bunch of idiots. They now are the geniuses and off to the races we go. So the tension can be lower or higher. It doesn't have to be off the charts tense. Differences can be managed. As some of you already know, and most of you discover, Managing difference is usually called marriage. You can manage fundamental clashes of interest and values. Otherwise, we would never have had marriage and we would never survive in any manner. So Russian power is not going away. It collapses and collapses and comes back. And so learning to manage and live with Russian power, learning to manage the fundamental clash of state interests and more deeper even than that, deeper than state interest clash is of course the values clash. That doesn't mean that Russia is wrong and the US is right. This is not a moral discussion. I take no political position. That's up to you to take if you want. Okay, let's say a little bit about the Cold War and then a little bit about our three readings and then we'll go to the seminar part. So we have the same dynamic with the Cold War. It's usually seen as a pejorative term. You know, who gets blamed for the Cold War? As if it was a mistake, a misunderstanding. You know, how could those people be so stupid as to fall into Cold War? 
Well, the Cold War was not a mistake or a misunderstanding. It was an achievement. It was absolutely fundamentally necessary and we should praise those who launched it. Because standing up to the Soviet system was the right idea. And Cold War is better than hot war. The whole point of a Cold War is you don't fight a hot war. You want to fight a hot war? Go right ahead. World War II claimed 55 million deaths, more than 100 million severely wounded, more than 100 million homeless across the world. You want a war like that? Go right ahead. Instead, how about a Cold War where you don't fight that way? Where 55 million people or 155 million or 255 million people don't have to die. But instead, you use strength and diplomacy to oppose what is in fact a menace. It took quite a long time for people living in the late 1940s to understand that they were already in a Cold War and that a Cold War was necessary, not a mistake. In the literature today, you still see discussions of who's to blame and you still, still see discussions about how there were alternatives to the Cold War that were missed. And I ask myself, what does that mean? People say, oh, you know, the Soviet Union was just out for its own security. It wasn't really trying to take over the world global communist style. It was just trying to provide for Soviet security. And I say, oh, really? You mean they needed to be secure in order to murder more of their people? They needed to be secure in order to impose that murderous system on their neighbors? Is that what we mean by security? because that's what the argument implies, even if the people don't argue that themselves. Moreover, the idea that they were only out for quote, their own security so that they could continue to murder at will, that's a great argument, except it implies that the US could have done something to make the Soviet Union feel secure. What is the evidence of that? And the answer is there is no evidence that there was any possible action by the US, including surrender, which would have made the regime in Moscow secure. Because the regime in Moscow was congenitally insecure. It was potentially the insecurity enhanced by actions outside, but the insecurity did not derive from actions outside. It derived from within. So sure, Cold War was a mistake. There were alternatives. Sure, let them take Poland. Let them take the Baltic states. Let them deport tens of thousands. Let them put them in the gulag in Siberia. Let them execute the political class and the cultural class. Let them do that again and again, as much as they want. Because, you know, we need to make them feel secure. Because, you know, the Cold War is a mistake because, you know, standing up to the Soviet menace, that's crazy. Okay, so those are my views. It took a long time for this to sink in. There were some big moments, the Berlin crisis, when Stalin fundamentally miscalculated, trying to close off access to West Berlin. The coup in Czechoslovakia in March, 1948, it looked like Hitler in Czechoslovakia redux. Slightly different methods, but same concept. Czechoslovakia losing its sovereignty. The big one, however, was the Korean War, when Stalin, after saying no for many, many years, said yes to Kim Il-sung so he could invade South Korea and, quote, reunify the peninsula. By that point, by that summer of 1950, everybody understood that not only were we in a, in a Cold War, but that we were necessarily in a Cold War, that it was the necessary, unavoidable thing to do. But it took quite a long time. If you look at the debates from 45 through 1950, 
They're all about, are we in a Cold War? Should we be in a Cold War? Every time people assert that we're in a Cold War, that tells you that the debate is not resolved. They're trying to assert it because there are doubts about it. You could apply this to China today. You know, are we in a Cold War? Should we be in a Cold War? Oh no, let's just let China do everything they want. They want to impose their security system on Hong Kong and violate the, the treaty that they themselves signed about one country, two systems. Go right ahead. We want to avoid a Cold War. We don't need a Cold War. Sure, let them swallow up Hong Kong in violation of the treaty. They want to attack Taiwan and bring Taiwan under their rule? Okay, sure, because otherwise we might be in a Cold War if, they, if we oppose that. They want to take the Senkaku Islands and provoke Japan? Okay, sure, go right ahead, because if we don't be careful, we could be in a Cold War with China. So, you know, I mean, you can avoid a Cold War. It's called surrender. It's very simple. Okay. Final point, I think I got a couple of seconds left here on uh, Novikov, Kennan, and Roberts. You don't mind living under unfreedom? Then you don't need a Cold War. It's a simple proposition. Unfreedom is an option. Go right ahead. When you live under freedom, you're disappointed. You see that there's injustice. You see that there are a lot of problems. You see that the institutions don't work the way you want them to work. You see that there are all sorts of issues that make you burn, but you have institutions that you can use to fix them. The beauty of a communist system is not only do they have the injustices, but there are no tools to correct them. Whereas in the US, you have all the injustices left and right, and you got the tools to correct them. So we can be disappointed, and I'm one of those people disappointed by the performance of the US system, fundamentally deeply disappointed. But I don't wanna live under unfreedom because then I don't have any tools to fix anything. Of course, I understand conformity. I teach at a university. The only thing you don't have to teach at a university is conformity because everybody already knows how to do it. So I could probably adapt, but I wouldn't want to. All right, on Novikov, Kennan, and Roberts. It's fantastic that we have now uh, these three to compare, uh, written the same year, okay, different months during that year, not the same time. It's just fantastic because what we have with Novikov is an assertion that the US is striving for global supremacy. Exactly what they're accusing Moscow of doing in Washington, striving for global supremacy. Novikov in an odd way is correct. The US was effectively striving for global supremacy. Novikov's understanding of this with all that Marxist gobbledygook and claptrap about reactionary forces and all sorts of nonsense, imperialism and highest stage of capitalism and the categories he uses to discuss this uh, don't put him in a good light in my view. The analysis is primitive. But the basic thrust that the US was a global power right, and striving for global supremacy. It actually already had global supremacy. In 1945, the US had a nuclear monopoly. It had 50% of global GDP. That's right, the US was 50% of global GDP. And also all the world's gold was in Fort Knox, with few exceptions. A gigantic perception of the world's gold was in Fort Knox. 50% of global GDP is a breathtaking number. We'll never see that again. And those nuclear weapons were also in their own evil way, a breathtaking, which we saw them in use at that time. 
So Novikov was right for the wrong reasons and interesting. He didn't make any policy prescriptions. It's a very bizarre analysis because it lays out a, the framework and then doesn't advise on what to do. And that's in part because the Soviets had no answer to US power in the world. They never found an answer to it. And in part because the Soviet Union didn't allow people to make recommendations unless they were specifically asked for them. If someone had said, Novikov, what do you recommend? He might have done it. He might have been afraid to do it because if he recommended something that they didn't like, he could lose not just his job, but his life. So even when they asked for recommendations, people were very cautious. First, they would have had to say, well, you know, comrade Molotov, comrade Stalin, what do you think we should do? And then when they heard what Molotov and Stalin thought they should do, then they would make those recommendations. But there are no recommendations. So the totalitarianism of the Soviet system is built in to Novikov's lack of recommendations. Canon. What's very interesting about Kennan is containment for Kennan is a strategy of rollback. It's not a permanent stasis. It's, it's, it's a balance of power uh, framework for the most part with Kennan, but the containment, the balancing of Soviet power, the counterforce as he called it, will induce an internal convulsion and a rollback, a kind of self rollback of the Soviet system. So the Cold War debate between containment and rollback, should we just contain communism or should we be on the offensive, trying to push it back, roll it back? That debate never ended until Kennan was proved right and the thing imploded on itself. But that debate is in Kennan's telegram. Because when he lays out containment, it's about rolling back the communist system. But the communist system will roll itself back if we just you have pressure from the outside. Finally, on Roberts. I think I'm a little bit over, uh, uh, but then again, we did have the self-introductions, which I valued very highly. Roberts also understood that the Soviet Union was a menace. So he gets an A, maybe even an A plus. The British establishment was debating this. They had just been through the appeasement of Hitler. And so you would think appeasement wouldn't work anymore. You would think people would have been discredited and said, you know, uh, next time a menace comes along, appeasement is probably not the right policy. However, Roberts was realistic about the limitations of what Britain could afford. So even though he correctly saw the Soviet Union as a menace, no illusions, excellent examples, he keeps apologizing for the alarming picture he's sending back in his three telegrams, as if it's not gonna be well received, right? So, so unlike Novikov, who's sending back Marxist-Leninist drivel, which Molotov himself is underlining because he wrote half of it, Roberts is sending back a message that maybe his superiors don't believe in. You see, because he lives in a free system and he can do stuff like that. And so he's looking in his telegram for a modus vivendi with the Soviet Union. He says, let's acknowledge it's a menace, but let's figure out how to live with it because Britain can't afford to go toe to toe with the Soviets around the globe. 